Hi, everybody. Um, uh, thanks for tuning in to my talk and happy Minerals Day 2020. Yay. Uh, my name is Liz Rampey and I'm a planetary scientist at the NASA Johnson Space Center. And I'm going to talk to you about advances in the mineralogy of Mars and specifically how we use minerals to interpret the geologic history of the Martian surface. So for those of you who might be educators or students or people who haven't taken a mineralogy class, uh, I'll start by just defining what a mineral is so we're all on the same page. Uh, the definition uh, of a mineral is that it is a naturally occurring crystalline solid with a definite but not necessarily fixed chemical composition. So I'll break this uh, definition down just a little bit. Naturally occurring means minerals are not man-made. Crystalline uh, means that the atoms in these solids are in a regular repeating order or in a crystal lattice. This definite but not fixed chemical composition means that uh, minerals are made up of a specific combination of elements, but some elements uh, can substitute for others in some minerals. Uh, the atomic structure and elemental composition of minerals control their physical properties. So things like color, crystal habit, and hardness. And some examples of some beautiful different colors and crystal habits are shown here on the right uh, in this small mineral collection. So let's briefly talk about minerals uh, forming in the solar system. Uh, so minerals form even before stars Form. So about a dozen minerals form in these pre-stellar molecular clouds. Uh, after stars and primitive meteorites form, uh, this results in about 60 mineral species. Uh, after, planet after planets form, this results in about 250 mineral species. And on Earth, which is a fairly complex uh, terrestrial planet, Volcanism, plate tectonics and the formation of continents, magmatic evolution, metamorphism, and water rock uh, interactions uh, produce about 1,500 mineral species. Minerals can tell us a lot about the geologic history of a planet. Uh, minerals precipitate as a result of physical, chemical, and biological processes. And one great thing about many minerals is that they form under fairly specific conditions. So when we find them in a rock, uh, we can use them to tell a lot about, uh, tell us a lot about the geologic history of that rock. So igneous minerals tell us about the uh, composition of magma or lava. Metamorphic minerals tell us about pressure and temperature conditions that a rock might have felt. And minerals in sedimentary environments tell us about the types of rocks that eroded to create those sediments and the lithification process of those sediments. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the geology of Earth, but uh, many of you might not be familiar with the geology of Mars. So I'll, I'll briefly go over the geology of the Martian surface. Uh, so today uh, we can see polar caps uh, both in the north and the south poles, these are made up of both water and CO2 ice. Uh, we see large volcanoes on the surface of Mars. Uh, these are inactive today, uh, but for scale, the largest one is Olympus Mons here on the left. Uh, it is about the size of the state of Arizona, and it's the largest volcano in the solar system. Uh, we see... Uh, uh, impact craters uh, from meteor impacts, especially uh, in the southern half of Mars, which is relatively older. Uh, and some of the uh, two of the largest impacts here I've, I've circled in purple. This is Hellas and this is Argyre. We also see an extensive uh, um, canyon system called Valles Marineris. For scale, this is about 3,000 miles across. And we also see some uh, outflow channels which formed from liquid water. And some of these outflow channels uh, can be uh, up to about a thousand miles in length. And if we look very closely at some of the most ancient terrains on Mars, we see other geomorphological features that are uh, indicative of liquid water on the surface of Mars in its very distant past. 
So we see uh, evidence for fossilized deltas uh, from rivers flowing into typically uh, lakes on crater floors. This is an example of a beautiful delta in Eberswalde Crater. We also see uh, systems and series of streams and rivers in some of the most ancient terrains on Mars. So when were all these processes active uh, on the Martian surface? Well, Mars was very active really early uh, in its history. Those frequent and large impacts were forming about 3.7 to, to 4.1 billion years ago. Volcanism was most active about three to four billion years ago, though there were punctuated pulses of volcanism throughout Mars's history. That large canyon system, Valles Marineris, formed about three to 3.5 billion years ago, and liquid water was most prevalent about three to four billion years ago and resulted in the formation of streams, rivers, deltas, and lakes, and those massive outflow channels. And finally, we see some evidence for fairly recent glaciation on Mars, maybe in the last billion years of its history. Moving on to how we identify minerals on Mars, there are a few different, different techniques that we use. Uh, one is through orbital measurements and uh, remote sensing using infrared spectrometers. And we use the infrared uh, because uh, mineral bonds within the crystal lattice vibrate in the infrared. This image on the right uh, shows you a portion of Jezero Crater, which is where the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover will land in February 2021. Uh, and Jezero is one of these places that has one of these beautiful preserved deltas uh, from a river uh, flowing into a, a lake on the crater floor. And these different colors represent different minerals that we've identified in Jezero uh, based on infrared spectroscopy. We can also use measurements uh, by landers and rovers to identify minerals on the Martian surface. This map shows you uh, where we have landed with either landers or rovers. And NASA has sent uh, or has landed uh, eight missions on the Martian surface so far. Uh, in a little bit, I'll, I'll tell you a lot more about the mineralogy of uh, Gale Crater that we are studying with curiosity because we have the Kemen X-ray diffraction instrument, which allows us to quantify minerals in modern sediments and ancient rocks. And here's the location of pers uh, or the um, uh, landing location for Perseverance uh, again at Jezero Crater in just a few short months. We can also study minerals in Martian meteorites. So these are rocks from Mars that were ejected from the surface from large meteor impacts. Uh, and some of those materials just happened to fall to Earth. Most of these Martian meteorites are igneous in nature, uh, but a few of them are, are, are a little different. So this is one example on the right. This is uh, NWA 7034. This is a regolith or an impact breccia. So it's made up of a variety of different class, which you can see in this cut surface of the meteorite. And this is from the near subsurface of Mars. So let's move on to the types of minerals that we find on Mars, starting with igneous minerals. Uh, uh, the most common igneous minerals that we find are plagioclase feldspars, uh, pyroxene, and olivine. And these two images show you uh, examples of detections of olivine. So this one on the left, this is a thin section of a Martian meteorite, Yamato 980459 in cross -pol polarized light. And these large grains with high birefringence uh, are olivine grains. On the right, this is a portion of Mars called Nili Fosse. This is in the same location uh, as uh, Jezero Crater, which is where Perseverance will, will land soon. Uh, and in these um, uh, red and yellow colors, this, uh, this represents uh, high concentrations of olivine based on orbital infrared spectroscopy. Moving on to metamorphic minerals on Mars, very few metamorphic minerals have been identified on the surface. And those that have been identified are indicative of low-grade metamorphism. Uh, this map on the right, again, is of the Nili Fosse uh, 
uh, region, which I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, and these uh, colored dots represent different um, minerals identified from infrared spectroscopy. And some of these are low-grade metamorphic minerals. So analcine, for example, is in dark blue. Uh, that is zeolite. Uh, chlorite or prenite uh, is in orange. That's another low-grade, these are other low-grade metamorphic minerals. And so this uh, uh, lack of high-grade uh, metamorphic minerals is consistent with a lack of plate tectonics uh, on Mars, because Mars just didn't have that ability to bring up rocks from the subsurface that uh, experienced higher pressure and temperature regimes. Okay, moving on to minerals and sedimentary deposits. These are minerals that formed from water rock interactions identified in ancient sedimentary deposits. Uh, in some of the most ancient terrains, uh, phyllosilicates or clay minerals are especially common. And these are, deposits are about three and a half to four billion years old. Uh, we find sulfate salts uh, as very common minerals in sedimentary deposits that are around the same age, but a little younger. So three and a half to 3.7 billion years old. Uh, and we actually see this stratigraphy, this mineral stratigraphy where phyllosilicates or clay minerals are in lower strata and sulfates are in higher strata in Gale Crater, which is where Curiosity is uh, 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 roving right now. So Gale Crater is an impact basin that's about 150 kilometers in diameter. And in the middle, there's this mound of layered sedimentary rock called Mount Sharp. Now, if we look closely at some of these lowermost layers, uh, and if we look um, in the infrared, we can see that the lowest layers uh, contain clay minerals and uh, strata that are slightly higher or slightly younger contain sulfates. So this change from uh, phyllosilicate or clay bearing rocks uh, to sulfate bearing rocks, we think represents a dramatic climate change that happened on Mars about three and a half billion years ago, where Mars gradually lost uh, its surface and near subsurface liquid water. Uh, there are many outstanding questions that we have about the surface of Mars, and some of these questions we can use minerals to help us solve. Uh, some of these questions include, what were the past environmental conditions on Mars? Uh, did these past environments vary between location and did they vary over time? And was this Martian surface and or near subsurface habitable to microbial life? And we're starting to answer some of these questions using the Curiosity rover, uh, studying a sedimentary sequence in Gale Crater. Uh, I want to tell you about the mineralogy of this sedimentary sequence, but first I'm going to start by showing you examples of the sedimentary rocks that we see along the traverse and what they tell us about depositional environments in Gale Crater. I'll also show you where we drilled rocks and scooped loose surface sediments and then delivered them to the Kemin X-ray diffractometer. And then I'll talk to you about those mineral abundances in the rocks and the sediments that we determined from Kemen uh, and what they tell us about past uh, environments in Gale Crater. So here is our traverse uh, from our landing site. We landed on the northwestern plains uh, of Gale Crater uh, in August 2012. And then here's our current location on the lower slopes of Mount Sharp. Uh, we've driven about 23 kilometers or about 14.3 miles in the last eight plus years. So I'm just going to show you some of the uh, uh, outcrops that we've studied along our traverse. Uh, almost all of the rocks that we've seen, 99% of them are sedimentary in nature. Uh, very close to our landing site, we found conglomerates, which are coarse grain sedimentary rocks. Uh, and you can see some of these coarser grains are rounded pebbles, suggesting deposition in a river or a stream. We also found mudstones, which are fine grain sedimentary rocks that are deposited in low energy environments like a lake. Uh, further down our traverse, we stopped at a place that we called the Kimberley, and the Kimberley is made up of these uh, sandstone beds that are dipping, dipping very gently towards the center of the crater. Uh, and this is consistent with a prograding delta deposit. So this is a location where a river or a stream was flowing into a lake on the crater floor. 
Once we got to the lowermost uh, layers of Mount Sharp, we saw abundant mudstone. So these fine grade sedimentary rocks indicative of deposition in a lake. Some of them were thickly laminated, suggesting they were deposited closer to the lake shore. And some of them were thinly laminated, uh, suggesting uh, a, a deposit uh, further from the lake shore. And in some locations, we saw evidence for the drying out uh, of these lake sediments. This example is uh, an outcrop that we named Old Soaker, and for scale, it's about a meter across. If you look at the surface, you can see these fossilized desiccation cracks. So this is from the sub-aerial drying of muds on the Martian surface about three and a half billion years ago. So after we've seen all of these uh, rocks that we have studied with curiosity, we can come up with an idea of what Gale Crater was like three and a half billion years ago. We know that Gale Crater had a system of rivers, lakes, and deltas. And this series of images is actually from Earth, but it represents what we think Gale Crater was like three and a half billion years ago. Uh, so looking up at the crater rim, there would have been snow and ice. Uh, the snow and ice would have melted, perhaps seasonally, creating these rivers and streams, deltas and lakes. Uh, and these lakes might have dried out. This might have been a cyclical process where there were some uh, wet periods and some dry periods. Curiosity is driven through about 400 vertical meters of stratigraphy. And this stratigraphy tells us that lakes were present in Gale Crater for at least tens of thousands of years, maybe upwards of 10 million years. Okay, now let's move on to the mineralogy of these sedimentary rocks. Again, this is our traverse. Uh, and these points show you where we've either scooped loose sediments, so wind-blown wind blown aeolian sediments in blue, or drilled ancient sedimentary rocks. Uh, either uh, fluvial, lacustrine, or aeolian. So we've sampled, uh, we've collected 32 samples to date and uh, delivered those samples or sediments uh, to the Kemen X-ray diffractometer inside the rover. And this is just a movie to show you how Kemen works. So after we collect uh, those samples, we deliver just a little bit of it to our instrument. Uh, it's delivered to one of 27 reusable sample cells. Uh, we then transmit uh, an x-ray beam through that sample. You can't see x-rays, obviously, but pretend you're wearing your x-ray glasses right now. And, and while we're transmitting that x-ray, we've got these piezoelectric actuators on the cell pairs that allow for convective grain motion. So we get all different grain orientations. Remember, minerals are these three-dimensional crystalline structures, and so these uh, x-rays are diffracting off of planes of atoms, and these diffracted x-rays are collected by a CCD. So we get these beautiful uh, 2D ring patterns. Every mineral has a distinct uh, pattern, and we can use these patterns to not only identify minerals, uh, in uh, the samples, but also quantify them down to a detection limit of about one weight percent. Uh, and I forgot to say that uh, I'm the deputy PI of this instrument uh, and also a member of the Curiosity Science team. So that's why I'm telling you so much about Curiosity. Okay, so these pie diagrams uh, show you the relative mineral abundances that we've identified with Kemen in these samples uh, that were deposited either by rivers or lakes. Uh, and this is just along uh, a little cartoon of our traverse going up Mount Sharp. So I'm just going to point out a few of these uh, mineral groups that are telling us something about uh, the past environments in Gale Crater. So in black is magnetite, an iron 2 plus 3 plus oxide. In red is hematite, an iron 3 plus oxide. And this change from magnetite-bearing uh, sediments to hematite-bearing sediments uh, suggests a change in those uh, uh, in uh, the uh, oxic conditions. So a change to more oxic conditions, either in the lake waters themselves uh, or in the groundwaters. Uh, in green slices of pie, these are phyllosilicates. Uh, specifically, these are smectites. Uh, at the base of the section, we find a, a trioctahedral smectite uh, called saponite, but as we drive into younger sediments, 
uh, we find uh, a change to dioctahedral smectites, so something like nontronite, and this suggests a change in the intensity, so a, a higher intensity of weathering going up section. Uh, in yellow, these are calcium sulfate salts. Uh, you can see that they are most abundant up section, suggesting that probably the groundwaters uh, were especially saline. And finally, these purple slices of pie are jericite. Uh, it's an iron three plus sulfate that forms very specifically in uh, acidic uh, sulfate conditions with a pH of two to four. And so this uh, variety of minerals that we find with Chemin suggests a variety of aqueous processes and demonstrate that these fluids had differences in pH, salinity, and redox conditions. Okay, so in this sort of weird COVID virtual times, I can't uh, really address the questions that you have, but I can address a few questions that I, I commonly get. And one question I commonly get is, how do minerals on Mars compare to minerals on Earth? Uh, well, uh, minerals on Earth are incredibly diverse. There are about 4,300 uh, different mineral species that have been identified. Two thirds of them are directly or indirectly associated with biological activity, uh, particularly the bacterial photosynthesis and increase in atmospheric oxygen that happened about 2.4 billion years ago on Earth. Also, most minerals on Earth are pretty rare. Uh, about 20% of the minerals identified on Earth uh, are only found in one location. Uh, and about 65% are only found in uh, less than 10 locations. Okay, moving on. Uh, thinking about identifying minerals on Mars, it's, it's much more difficult for us to identify and quantify minerals uh, on the Martian surface uh, because we're using remote sensing measurements and, and in situ measurements on landers and rovers. We've identified about 25 mineral species uh, from Chemin on Curiosity and a few dozen others uh, using remote sensing techniques like infrared spectroscopy. But of course, these have not been confirmed with in situ measurements like X-ray diffraction. So it appears that minerals on Mars are less diverse than those on Earth. Um, and this might be related to the lack of plate tectonics. So we're missing all of those metamorphic minerals because of the lack of plate tectonics. Uh, this might be also related to a lack of life on Mars. Uh, we haven't discovered life on Mars, and so maybe this lack of the great oxygenation event uh, that happened on Earth 2.4 billion years ago uh, resulted in a, a, a lower diversity of minerals on, on Mars. But the other thing to consider is we've only landed at eight locations on the Martian surface, and this, these locations certainly don't represent all of the mineral diversity on the Martian surface. Uh, the other thing is that most missions didn't have mineralogical instruments uh, like the uh, Chemin X-ray diffraction instrument. So again, it's, it's hard for us to identify minerals on the Martian surface. Uh, the other question I get is, are there any minerals on Mars that we don't find on Earth? Uh, the short answer is not yet. Uh, a longer answer is that so some minerals on Mars are, are more common than some minerals on Earth. Uh, for example, mafic minerals are really common on the Martian surface, so things like pyroxenes and olivine. Uh, also, iron oxides are especially abundant, and so are sulfates. Uh, Mars has more iron and sulfur than Earth does just because of where these two planets formed in the solar system. And so that explains this abundance of iron oxides and sulfates on Mars. I want to end my talk by talking about uh, next steps in the identification of minerals on Mars. So I've said a few times before that the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover will land in Jezero Crater in February 2021, and it's going to land in a mineralogically diverse region. Uh, one especially interesting aspect of Jezero Crater is that carbonates have been identified from orbit. Uh, we have not, uh, we've seen very little evidence for carbonates in Gale Crater, so this is one way that uh, Jezero is different from Gale. And there will be a few different instruments to allow us to identify minerals in Jezero Crater, including infrared and Raman spectrometers. 
And perhaps the most important aspect of the Mars 2020 uh, mission is that Perseverance will collect about 20 rock uh, drill cores and at least one modern windblown Aeolian sediment for eventual return to Earth. Uh, so hopefully in about 10 years or so, uh, we scientists can study the minerals in these samples using our laboratory instruments, and we can identify minerals that are in abundances of much less than one weight percent, which is our detection limit with, uh, with Kemen. Uh, and I predict that this will dramatically increase the number of minerals that we've identified on Mars, and not only tell us more about the geologic history of Jezero Crater, but about the geologic history of Mars itself. So again, thanks very much for tuning in and happy Minerals Day, everybody.